Okay. Well, good morning, everybody, and, and welcome to the University of Edinburgh and this our historic Rayburn Room. Uh, thank you all for coming in this filthy weather. Uh, just uh, to begin with, a few um, housekeeping announcements. Uh, can you all please switch your mobiles to silent? Uh, we are webcasting this, uh, so we would like you to use a roving mic that will be around to ask questions. So please wait uh, until you get the mic before uh, asking your question. Uh, for the photographers, please, can you sort of stay down, down the center of the room and avoid the sides and bumping into our precious uh, Rayburn paintings? Uh, as far as the organization of the session is concerned, uh, I'm going to try to bring it to a sharp close at about uh, 11.30. Uh, then, again, for photographers, if they wish, we'll have a short session with Peter uh, on his own up in the Playfair li Library at 11.30, uh, and then that will be the end of the proceedings. Okay, so let me begin with a few introductions. Uh, I'm Richard Kenway. I'm the Tate Professor of Mathematical Physics here at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, on my far right is Victoria Martin. She's a member of the ATLAS collaboration at CERN, which has discovered uh, the particle that is most likely the Higgs boson. Uh, and on my left here is Alan Walker, who's a long-standing colleague uh, of Peter's, and I don't think Peter needs any introduction from me. So today we celebrate the discovery of the last piece of the jigsaw that is the standard model of elementary particle physics. It's a result of, as I'm sure you know, over 50 years of work, starting from uh, the inspiration of Peter uh, but then the work of thousands of physicists over the subsequent time, and of course culminating with the work of the two teams of experimentalists at CERN, CMS and ATLAS, who made the discovery uh, in the past week, or completed the discovery in the past week. When you complete a jigsaw, one of the things you like to do, especially if it's taking you over 50 years, is to stand back and admire the picture. So the picture here is the standard model of elementary particle physics. It might not have worked this way. There was some possibility that the Higgs boson would not have been found. And then today, instead of this press conference, we might have been standing around a bonfire of the textbooks. <laughs> but happily, that picture of elementary particle physics is now complete. Now, I'm assuming that the, the particle that Victoria and company have found really is the Higgs boson in making that statement. It is a triumph for theoretical physics. Uh, we now have a complete theory of all of the elementary particle particles that we know about. But it's not the end of the story by any means. Those elementary particles described by the standard model only make up about 4% of the universe. The rest largely is unknown to us. The Higgs boson itself is quite a curious particle. There are other particles in the standard model which have similar properties to the Higgs but they're all made out of other particles. They're built, built up as composites of more elementary particles. So that begs the question as to whether the Higgs boson itself is a uniquely special particle that is elementary or whether it itself is made up of other stuff. And so it immediately begs the question, what is the Higgs boson made of? In recognition of Peter's contribution to theoretical physics, the way his work in particular has positioned Edinburgh uh, as a focus 
for this discovery, uh, and recognizing that there are these big questions yet to be answered. Today, the university is announcing the formation of a new center for theoretical physics that will be called the Higgs Center for Theoretical Physics. And we intend it to become the focal point uh, for efforts internationally to develop new theories that will help us to understand uh, the universe at the next level down, at a more fundamental level uh, than the standard model now gives us. So you have uh, press releases from the university which describe uh, our center in more detail. I think you've heard enough from me. Uh, I'd like to now open up the floor to your questions. Uh, and as I say, please, can you wait for the mic? I'll do my best to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask a question. OK, over to you. Who wants to go first? Professor Higgs, Jane Chilton, Sky News. It's called the God Particle. Does this mean that there is no such thing as God? This explains where mass comes from. The name, the, the God Particle, is nothing to do with me. It was a joke. The, the, the author of a, a book uh, about the so-called so God path, Particle uh, wanted to uh, give the title that goddamn particle to his book because the, this one was so difficult to find. His publisher didn't like it, so he said, all right, what about the god particle? It's a joke. Claire Stewart from STV News. Professor Higgs, do you think you're now in line for a Nobel Prize? Do you think you're in line for a Nobel Prize? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't have close friends on the Nobel Committee. <laughs> I haven't heard. <laughs> Simon Johnson from the Daily Telegraph. Um, there are five other theoretical physicists, four of whom are still alive, who can also lay claim to making a great contribution towards this discovery. Um, do you think the Nobel rule should be relaxed so that more than three people can be awarded the prize? I, I, I don't know. It, re, it remains for the, the Nobel Committee, if, if they're interested in the, this result, to see whether they really have a problem. Uh, because the, the, there were six of us all together. Uh, the most senior person, Robert Brout, uh, in, from Br Brussels, has already died. So there are five of us left. And the, the, the things we actually wrote have somewhat different, different flavors you, as you go from one group to another. So I think the, no, it's up to the Nobel co Committee if, if they, they're concerned to decide whether there's a problem. Jenny File from The Scotsman. Um, what did you do to celebrate? Did you crack open the champagne as you said you would? What did you do to celebrate? Did you crack out your promised bottle of champagne? Uh, well, I, I, I have, a, have a confession. Uh, a, a, a bottle of champagne was opened uh, at a dinner hosted by someone from CERN that uh, I attended on Tuesday evening before the seminar. Let, let Alan comment. Um, we were uh, flying back, Peter and I, together on EasyJet after the press conference, and I said to Peter, would he like to share a glass of Prosecco? And he said, I'd rather have a beer, and he had a <laughs> can of London Pride. <laughs> so I shared the Prosecco with a, uh, who just happened to be in the seat behind us, was a student from Glasgow, you'll know about the Super Alliance, and so we shared a small bottle of Prosecco between us, and I have to say that Peter, after then, celebrated with a, a can of London Pride. What he's done since then, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably open to the whole panel. What kind of, sorry, Claire from STV mm -hmm. again, what technological developments could we see emerging from this? What could it mean for our century? I have no idea. Uh, uh, the, the, what I can say is that I think it's difficult for anybody to have an idea. The reason being that uh, this, uh, the, the discovery of this particle is actually the recognition of, of what it 
decays into. But it, it is, it's around for a, a very short time. It's probably about a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a second. I don't know how you apply that to anything useful. It's hard enough with particles which have longer uh, lifetimes for decay to make them useful. I mean, some of the uh, ones which, which have lifetimes of only maybe a millionth of a second or so are used in medical applications, uh, and uh, that, that relies on the fact that, that if they're going fairly fast, then they, they last a bit longer, and you can use them for therapy, uh, attacking tumors and so on. But how you, could, you, you can get an application of this thing, which is very short-lived, I have no idea. Alan. I'd like to add a comment. Um, I'll remind you that when J.J. Thompson discovered the electron on the walls of the Cavendish Laboratory, it said, God bless the electron, may it be of some use. You guys wouldn't be operating in this room without that. And uh, in fact, what really happens in this superb machine, the Large Hadron Collider, and those superb detectors that have done this work, is that technology is developed during the building of that which wasn't there before. When people were planning these machines, they were having to invent the technology, but they knew the physics already, so they knew that this should work. And it's a real testimony that that technological push, which will have all sorts of ramifications for all sorts of other things, will actually already be paying off. And I remind you on blogs, for example, when there's a discussion about the work going on at CERN, a guy from Glasgow writes, why are these scientists doing this? What have they ever done for us? And he's posting from a computer on the World Wide Web. I think sometimes people accept for granted things that are already there, which we've already benefited from in the push to the technology for this sort of thing. I think it is important also to make the cultural point that we have reached a new stage of understanding the world around us. When I talk about the standard model, uh, that is what underpins all of modern technology. Uh, and, you know, the Higgs boson is confirmation that we've got that right. Uh, and so it provides an amazing platform from which we can move forward in our scientific investigations, knowing that we've got uh, a good understanding uh, of how the universe works, albeit there's some big open questions. So I think it's, it is very difficult at this stage, and certainly uh, it could take decades before we understand the full consequences of discovering the Higgs boson. Uh, but uh, what we know is that we are on the right track to really understanding at a fundamental level how the universe works. I, mean, I would add, as an experimentalist looking for this particle, my motivation isn't for the applications. Part of the, the fun of finding it is actually the journey. So Alan mentioned some of the technological spin-off that, that come out of us trying to do the work. That's not personally why I do it. It's why some of my colleagues do it. it but I, it's really just to enhance our knowledge. It's to find something else about the universe. It's not for me, for many people, about the applications. Although we do hope there might be some, maybe not directly from the Higgs boson itself, but from the work that we have to do just to find the Higgs boson. Another question? Uh, Dr. Higgs, uh, Taro Mitamura, NHK, Japanese Public TV. Uh, could you tell us uh, your relation with uh, Dr. Nambu in USA? Uh, when you have submitted the paper to uh, physics review letter, I think Dr. Nambu was uh, left free at that time. Well, the the uh, the role of uh, Yoichiro Nambu in this is a very important one because he uh, he of course already has a, an, a, sh a share of a Nobel Prize from 2008 for his insight in starting the whole program of understanding elementary particle theory in 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 this way. It was it was his program that all of us. Uh, all of the six people involved in 1964 fitted into what we did was to uh, s simply fill in uh, fill in a gap in what Nambu had already started doing. Uh, but the personal 
co connection for me is certainly through my second very short uh, paper that I wrote in 1964, the one which uh, explicitly contains what became known as the Higgs model. And uh, the story of that is that I, uh, I'd already uh, had a, a previous short paper accepted by physics letters, not physical review letters. Physics letters was the European journal uh, of the same kind as physical review letters. And as a good European, uh, I submitted <laughs> my paper to, 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 to it. The first paper was accepted, but the first paper was not a very, very uh, physical kind of paper. It was a, a sort of mathematical r remark about the way to avoid some trouble in the NAMBU program. Uh, then I sent off, after another week, the, the second short paper, which, which actually showed what were the consequences of, of uh, doing the theory that, this, this way. And uh, it was rejected by Physics Letters. Uh, are, somewhat ironically, the editor of Physics Letters that I sent it to, and presumably also the referee who said this is rubbish, or words to that effect, were at CERN. Uh, so I got back a, a, a letter suggesting I do some more work and submit a paper, fuller paper somewhere else. Uh, so then I, I thought, what have I failed to tell them? I, I've, I've said too little. So I added on some paragraphs, which with, included the first uh, remark about what is n n now known as, as the Higgs boson. Uh, and I sent that off to, across the Atlantic, because I thought the people at CERN don't, don't understand what I'm doing. Uh, and it was accepted by physical review letters, and the referee, and of course I didn't know who the referee was, uh, drew my attention to a paper which they had just published uh, at the end of August 64 by Anglais and Braut in Brussels, uh, about which I'd had, had no previous knowledge. I didn't know they were even working on that sort of thing. Uh, uh, so I added a note about that. Then uh, 20 years later, I think it was, 1984, I was at a conference in uh, Wisconsin, at uh, Racine, Wisconsin, on the developments in, in this subject, uh, at which I met Nambu, and he confessed that he had been the referee. And that uh, explained to me why, why the second version of the paper had been well understood. <laughs> Another question? Um, well, I think here, please, and then, then I'll come to you. Thank you. Shen Shen Zhang from Chinese Xinhua News Agency. Professor Higgis, um, we know that many scientists from many countries are involved in the experiments. Um, could you give us some comments on the international effort, especially for China, on Chinese uh, scientists' contribution? The experiments? Yeah, the, the international effort on the experiments and any contribution by Chinese scientists. I, don't know, I might call Victoria to help me a bit I, on that one. Yes, but, I, uh, yes I, think, I think I shall need help. I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm well aware of the way in, in which the international collaborations have been expanding, and it's very good to, 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 to see that, uh, I mean, whereas many years ago, uh, it, it, the collaborations were, were most, mostly from, from Europe and the United States, it's, it's really now worldwide in, in, uh, with, with a, a big contribution from, from China and Japan and India and many countries. Victoria. Yeah, yeah so the two collaborations, ATLAS and CMS, that um, discovered this new particle, um, which was announced on Wednesday, include, like Peter said, members from all over the world. And there is um, a large fraction of people from, from China who helped in the, in the discovery of this. So we, I like to think we all kind of co-discovered this. We're not, as an experimentalist, we're not yet calling it the Higgs boson, but a Higgs boson. So we're all co-discoverers, international co-discoverers of this new particle. And um, then there was a question here, and then I'll come back. Well, all right. <laughs> Uh, Sam Johns from The Telegraph again. Um, as Professor Kenway referred to uh, Professor Higgs, 
It was far from certain that your theory, when it was published in 64, would turn out to be correct, and we'd all be sat here today. So you must feel a tremendous sense of vindication. Yes, it's very nice to be right sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> First here, and then, then I'll come to you. It's basically the same question, just how does it feel for the, uh, the wait of almost half a century to be over and to be proved right? Uh, well, it's certainly been a long, a long wait. And uh, as I think I, I, I said when I was in Geneva, uh, at, at the beginning, I, I had no idea wh whether a discovery would, would be made in my lifetime because we knew so little at the beginning about where this particle might be in, in mass and therefore how high an energy machines would have to go before, before it could be discovered. And it, there's been a, a very long uh, development over the years of the technology of building machines at higher and higher energy. And uh, the uh, LHC is, is the one which, which has been energetic enough and, and also uh, uh, intense enough in, in terms of its the, the particle beams to do it. So it's 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 been a, a long wait, but um, uh, it might have been even longer. I might not have been still around. So there's a question there. Just yeah. again on the, the 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 feeling of it's nice to be right. There were some people who were sceptical, uh, notably Stephen Hawking. Who took out a bet? I believe. Have you heard from him since? Uh, uh, yes, I, 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 I have heard from him. He, it, it, I'm not the one that he owes money to, but, <laughs> but uh, I think he's sending a hundred dollars to Gordy Kane at the University of Michigan, who, who was the one who did the bet, took up the bet with him. There's a question here. Les about from Deadline News. Um, what is the future now for the, the Large Hadron Collider? What if, now that the Higgs boson has been discovered, is it going to be put to further use, or is it mission completed? Basically? What is the future of the Large Hadron Collider now the Higgs has been discovered? They have a lot to do. Uh, I mean, as, I mean, as a first stage, uh, they 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 have what is believed to be a discovery, uh, but they don't know very much yet about the object they've discovered. They, they have a, a, a lot of data analysis uh, and, and measurements to do uh, to establish uh, whether it is a, a single, for example, a single Higgs boson of the simplest possible version of the theory, or part of a more uh, elaborate structure which might involve what's called supersymmetry. That's the first stage. When they've sorted out its properties, I, I should in, uh, also include that uh, although uh, I, I, I think people at CERN have told me that already that there's no sign at the moment of structure to this thing, that whether it might be composite, I, 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 th I think they, they can't be really definite about that for a long time because it depends on the really on the scale of the structure, but the, the th theories which there are in existence about a composite particle of this sort, uh, I think tend to imply that structure might be easy, fairly easy to discover. But even after that, then uh, there's, there's the rest of the LHC program. Uh, the LHC wasn't built just to discover the Higgs boson. It was built to explore particle physics at a higher energy range than was ever, had ever been done before. And the more, more interesting thing to me than just the uh, discovery of, that, that has, has been made is, is what is going to be discovered in the future. Will they discover things beyond the standard model which give us more understanding of the structure of the universe, the, the dark matter problem, there are lots of other things that, that they have left to do. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, you, you may have had the impression from the amount of publicity that this thing has received uh, in the past and in the last few days, uh, but that was an important stage in what the LHC was for, but there's much more to do. 
I don't think Victoria is planning to retire soon. No, so no, I, I would. Want to I mean, no, no, I would say future. there's. I mean, in in some sense, this is just the beginning of the story of the Large Hadron Collider. We've been running now for four years, and I expect it to go on for at least the next ten years. Um, people are talking about running it for the next twenty years, I and mean, it was a, a big investment of people's time, energy. Um, it was a big financial investment that, that the European countries and the whole world made in this. And we are going to keep running it for as long as it gives us um, useful data that we can analyze and we can understand, as Peter said, more about the, the fundamental subatomic physics and the structure of matter as it is. And I, I've got a long way, quite a long way still till I retire. And <laughs> <laughs> Alan. Um, <coughs> What the Higgs boson does primarily in its uh, <coughs> implementation into the standard model is to give mass to what we call the uh, W and Z bosons and leaves the photon massless, but it also within the standard model gives mass to the variety of quarks that are in the standard mm -hmm. model, and there's a mass hierarchy there. And what we have to do is to pin down that this Higgs boson does couple to those particles in the way it should, according to those masses. Because I remind you, top and bottom quarks disappear very rapidly in the expansion of the universe, and then charm and strange at some later stage. And everyone sitting in this room is made of up and down quarks and electrons. We're at the bottom end of that mass food chain. And so we need to, to pin down that the Higgs boson itself it gives those couplings. I mean, maybe you want to put it. One thing I, uh, this is just a detail which I would add to that, is that uh, when I was at, uh, at, at CERN, uh, I think it was on, on, on Tuesday, Tuesday, late Tuesday afternoon before I, I, I went to uh, enjoy John Ellis's champagne that <laughs> evening, jo John Ellis showed me a, a, a plot uh, which his one of his students had made, which was looking at the question of whether the strength of interaction of the Higgs boson with other particles was indeed proportional to their mass, which is an important feature. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it's, it's a sort of st statistical thing. It's, there's lots of errors involved, but the the sort of blob in, in the middle sits pretty well where it ought, ought to be, and that's from a com comparison so far of just two interactions, and there are lots of others to look at. Yeah. So it's starting to walk like a duck and quack a bit like a duck. <laughs> uh, there's a question here. Hi, Rodney Jefferson from Bloomberg News. Um, I just want to ask, uh, you have a, a new center that is being named after you, uh, Professor Higgs, and um, what advice would you give to scientists studying the next stage? I don't know how, how <laughs> quite how to answer, answer that, but, uh, but uh, you know, other than, well, keep at it. <laughs> I think it's an exciting opportunity for us, uh, as has been said several times, uh, particle physics now is a, a worldwide activity. Uh, we want to keep Edinburgh on that world stage uh, as we hopefully both experimentally discover uh, new phenomena, but then need to uh, understand the consequences, understand what the the new particles that hopefully will be discovered actually mean uh, in terms of explaining how the universe works. So uh, our intention is to bring the theorists from around the world uh, together. And uh, who knows, one of them <laughs> may be an, you know, have an idea that has the same sort of impact as Peter's idea had in 1964. But I don't think Peter had any idea in 1964 what the consequences of that short paper were going to be. And it's really very hard, I think, for us to know uh, when, will be the right, you know, when will the right person have the right idea that, that unlocks the mystery of what is you know, a better theory uh, than the, we, the one we've just celebrated. Uh, perhaps I should uh, add something to, to Richard's remarks uh, about the involvement of uh, 
of, of Edinburgh and uh, other Scottish universities in this sort of thing. Uh, back in 1960, we held the very first Scottish University's summer school in physics. It was held out at uh, New Battle Abbey College near Dalkeith. Uh, two, of the, two of the people who were there as participants, i.e. students, have shared Nobel Prizes for, for part of this work that has been, been you know, the stages in, in, the, in the work that has been going on uh, understanding this kind of thing. So perhaps the message is if you want to win a Nobel Prize, come to Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> Alan. Um, I um, was involved in a lot of Scottish universities summer school in physics, particularly the particle physics one. I'm pleased now that I'm the Treasurer Secretary of the organisation, the Governing Committee, and I can let you know that there will be one in August on LHC Physics to be held in St Andrews in August, and I think they may have a slightly different agenda now. <laughs> so, there's a question there. We've seen uh, recently billions going to bailout banks. Do you think government is sufficiently funding science, and if not, would this be a good time to start? Sufficient funding. Is, is, is government funding science sufficiently? Uh, well, the, 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 the answer, of course, from, from, uh, from all scientists is no, of course not. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I can appreciate the the difficulties that are involved at the at the government level in in deciding what the level of funding should should be, uh, and there have been various t times in the past when, under particular uh, science ministers, where the funding situation ha has improved considerably. The present time, I think, is not, not one of them. Uh, but of course, there are problems uh, in, Euro in Europe uh, as, as a whole about the financial situation. W w one of the things which, which I, I've noticed uh, in relation to funding of organizations like, like CERN is that they are widening the net in terms of uh, member, uh, who, who are member states, whereas, whereas once it was only Europe. Uh, n n I'm not quite sure how far it's, the, the membership has been extended uh, now, I, but, but very noticeably when I was at CERN, India is involved. Yeah. And I anticipate that the, the, the sort of spread of the international uh, contributions to continue this kind of activity, it will, it will continue to be a, a spreading to, to more and more countries, especially those who are not suffering the financial problems that Europe and the United States are presently suffering. So I think there is growing recognition that science has an important role to play in driving economic recovery. Uh, and I think, when I say that, I think the politicians are getting the message. Uh, part of that is that in the course of seeking things like the Higgs boson, we have to invent new technologies, as, as Alan and, and Victoria have commented earlier. So there is spin-off technologies as part of the process. But I think, particularly today, a key reason for supporting efforts to search for things like the Higgs boson is the number of you around this table uh, which reflects the public interest uh, in finding out more about how the universe works. And what that is doing is uh, creating a generation of young people who are inspired to come into careers in science. And fundamentally, it's going to be people that drive economic recovery. And so I think you know, the important message is, yes, there's technology spin-off, but also Things like this and occasions like this have an enormously important role in sending the message that a career in science is exciting and uh, worth the effort. Alan. I'd like to add something which will perhaps drive that as well. I've been involved in public outreach, particularly in particle physics, for a long time. 
there is absolutely no shortage of interest from the general public and from students from schools. They're touched by this. They understand this. There isn't a shortage of people now wanting to do physics. And with that sort of drive, I think there's a popular upswell. And just look out there how many popular science books now which are becoming bestsellers. There are certain people who actually contribute to that as well in terms of media interest and so on. But generally, the people are now in the street who have no intention to go in physics are actually getting interested in this sort of thing. But a lot of young people are now becoming much more interested in doing physics. And I think that sort of impact will also affect public perception and the support for the funding. That's a question there. Just on a similar theme, Professor Higgs, now you, you have retired and you look back and you look at education, do you not fear that the government priorities and priorities in education are very much um, not in favour of theoretical study? They're more in favour of uh, degrees that help you get a job so that the kind of research that you had time to do you know, it, 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 it is less favourable to funders, to government funding. Yes, that's true. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, it, <coughs> it's um, certainly noticeable that there's been a, a shift in the, in the, that direction, as you said. And, but I, I think the the important thing is to be able to to preserve um, the the kinds of activity that I I I, I have been involved in. Just in terms of long-term consequences, rather than you know short-term benefit. <coughs> There's no gain without pain, and I hope, as I said earlier, that the excitement of <coughs> this discovery will motivate young people to make the effort uh, to Thank you. take I? careers in the hard sciences. And it is difficult, uh, but there are rewards. Can I add? I don't think there's any. Uh, problem with people who have a mind that's trained in the analyst and analytical work and the the sort of thing that you do in physics there is no real difficulty about getting employment it may not be as a physicist but there is, you, you what you get out of that is a, a mind that can analyze and, and reason and so on and so the pure sciences are if you like more open-ended in where you might end up in a job whereas there might be a difficulty sometimes, say, in civil engineering if there's a downturn and so on. So I, I don't think that doing pure science is, if you like, a dead end where you'll not be employed at the end. It's probably quite the contrary. I, I can actually back this up because I did a degree at the University of Edinburgh in mathematical physics, and I was actually, Peter was one of my lecturers, and I have now failed to become a theoretical physicist. I'm now <laughs> a, an experimental physicist, a practical physicist. But the skills I learned doing mathematical physics are still applicable. Now, I th I, most people won't see the difference, but a lot of my theory colleagues will see that I'm a failed theorist and <laughs> off now doing experiments. It's OK, Victoria. We do forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Higgs, did you ever have any doubts over the last 50 years that you would be proved right? Well, let me put it this way. Uh, the, the, um, the existence of, of this particle is so crucial to uh, un understanding how the rest of the theory works as well as it already does in terms of previous experimental verifications of, of, of the, the structure, that, that it was very hard for me to understand uh, how it couldn't be there. Uh, if, it, if, it, if it was not there, I w I, if it was proved to be non-existent, I would say uh, I, I no longer understand a whole area of uh, theoretical and particle physics that I thought I did understand in recent years and which were, when I was an undergraduate, a complete mystery. Yeah, but really, if there had not been a Higgs boson, then there's no way in which we could have completed the theory. It, it becomes inconsistent, and it is very difficult, as Peter says, 
to understand how it could have worked so well uh, everywhere else and yet have this one missing piece. Uh, so uh, it, while it would have been uh, earth-shaking uh, had there been no Higgs boson, uh, I think almost every physicist everywhere uh, felt like Peter that uh, it had to be. But that, in a sense, made the hunt even more exciting. I mean, it just it turned out the Higgs boson turned out to be in the one place or that was the hardest to find. That's why we've had to wait so long, so many years with so many different colliders. And then um, we've been chasing it down and it, it looked like it was over there for a little while and now we found it there, but it, it was almost the hardest place to see it. Yes. Two questions, if that's okay. Um, do you think, as a result of this, that it's been such a mischief mischievous particle that it would be better to now rename it the goddamn particle rather than the god particle? <laughs> and I think you said you had heard from uh, Richard Dawkins. Um, in what form did he? Has he been? Did he contact you? And if so, what did he say? Uh, um, well, well, I, uh, I, I don't, uh, I don't know about re renaming. The particle, because uh, I, I, I think the the term God particle is is one which is used by no physicist involved. Uh, so it, it, it's only you know the the non physicists, the wi the wider public who 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 uh, have heard this term and and take it seriously. Uh, so that's one one thing. It, 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 the the only the only real problem. Is is whether now it's known to to have been discovered, uh, w will it c continue to be called the Higgs particle? That would be unusual in terms of of sort of nomenclature in particle physics. M maybe it will uh, just uh, end up as a as a single letter, the H, uh, <laughs> which of course is confusing because it's also the, the symbol for hydrogen. Um, <laughs> Uh, um, well, uh, as, as for, for the, the uh, communication from Stephen Hawking, uh, I mean, Alan sh showed, showed me uh, something which was from Stephen Hawking when we were on, on the flight back from Geneva, and uh, I can't recall the details, so maybe I, I could ask him to answer that. Uh, well, from Stephen Hawking, we have a report. I think it was up probably in the Times. It said... Renowned British physicist Stephen Hawking said Professor Higgs deserved the Nobel Prize. Uh, I don't know, uh, we did have something, but I don't have my iPhone with me, so I don't have the other uh, message. But uh, it, it, it's, it's certainly true that at some stage Stephen Hawking bet that there would be no Higgs boson. So uh, that actually is rather gracious of him to say that now. And of course, to send the $100 to Gordy Kane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so first there and then, then, then you. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Frédéric Durand with NHK Japanese TV. Uh, we saw how big of an effort we had uh, to discover this new uh, particle. So for the future discoveries that are still waiting, uh, what kind of science you, you think uh, will require for, for further research in this field? Well, um, I mean, for... for the, the, the next wa wave of possible discoveries in particle physics, we, we already have the uh, LHC in, in, in operation, and it's, I mean, the kind of activity involved is, is, uh, is not much different for, for the future discoveries from what it is for, for, for this one. Is that fair, Victoria? Yeah, that's correct. So the Large Hadron Collider which, as I said, we, we hope to keep running for at least the next 10 years, if not the next 20 years, is the place where we'll manage to make um, the measurements that will tell us about, about any other new particles or new phenomena that take place down at the subatomic level. At present, we, uh, the Large Hadron Collider is running at 8 TeV, and its design is for 14. Um, so that will actually not occur uh, until there's a shutdown in 20. 13, 14. Yeah, 2014. And after that, then it will be planned to upgrade the uh, move the energy upwards. But there was an announcement on the Wednesday morning 
that the uh, Large Hadron Collider this year is going to continue running into mid-December, which is longer than it was planned. And the iron run that was actually planned for the later part of the year is pushed into next year. So there has been some uh, opportunity here to extend the run because the data taking is so good that some of the properties, not all of them, will be perhaps pinned down with better statistics. And I'll remind you that the LHC operation um, to date, as in this year, has actually achieved all the data, the same amount of data as last year. And last year they did exactly the same thing. So the data rate is going up because of the magnificent work of the, the machine uh, people. Uh, and uh, of course, it may well be that they can improve that towards the end of the year. So there will be a lot more data and a lot more data to analyze, which will pin down some of the more details, I think. But it won't actually, I think, according to Rolf Hoyer, be definitive. We may have to wait for the later upgrade to get exactly the answers to all of the questions. And going to a higher regime would may and open up the opportunity to see some of these particles that may be there to answer some of the other secrets. Are there supersymmetric particles? Is there a candidate amongst those supersymmetric particles in neutralino, which would may be the particle of dark matter? These are open questions. Watch this space. And there is a worldwide activity to think about the technology for a new collider that would follow the Large Hadron Collider uh, that most likely, uh, instead of colliding protons, will collide electrons and positrons. Uh, and, of course, it depends how things develop in the LHC studies of the Higgs boson, but may well target a very detailed study uh, of Higgs physics now that we know where to look. Uh, but that, that's just a signal that the Large Hadron Collider almost certainly is not the last uh, collider that we will be building. Um, I'll come to you, but there's a question here first. Uh, Dr. Higgs, do, do, do you expect this discovery, this discovery uh, in your life? Not at the beginning, no. Uh, because, well, uh, uh, let me put in uh, something a bit more quantitative about that. The, 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 the basic problem was that uh, in the 60s, uh, when, when the kind of theory that I was discussing in '64 was, as it were, focused on the electroweak interactions by Abdus Salam and uh, C Stephen Weinberg, or perhaps the other way around, um, uh, by essentially uh, bolting the kind of thing I had done onto an existing. A model by Glashow. Uh, at that stage, I think it was Weinberg who who did a, a rough calculation of uh, what were the constraints on the Higgs boson mass for the theory to continue to work in the same way as it does for lower masses. Uh, and he put it at around one TeV. That's a thousand GeV. Now, if it had been uh, there, uh, I mean, at, uh, in 1960, well, it was when he did that, which was probably his latest, 1970, 71, 72. Um, back then, uh, it, it, it wasn't clear how, how you would get up to that sort of energy. And uh, things which had to be done first were done uh, at lower energy, with, uh, with other machines like LEP, which was the first m machine put in that tunnel at CERN. So it, it was a gradual process where, by which the measurements which were made at LEP and at other machines like the Tevatron at Chicago uh, constrained the expected mass of the Higgs boson to be somewhat lower than what Weinberg said was the you know re the highest possible, so it began to come within range, as it were, that it could be done in the foreseeable future. But it's a it's a long long process. I mean, the process of uh, planning and building the machines really uh, well. When I was at uh, spent two months at CERN in the aut autumn of '76, LEP was being planned. It, decisions about how big it should be, how high an energy it should go to. That was when they 
decided they had to tunnel under the Jura. Um, and um, it, it was only at, at that stage that the uh, machine development began, uh, which brought about this last result. So that, that, so that stage um, began um, around 75, 76. Before that, it, it was just a, a, a stage at which the uh, experimental discoveries were such as to get people excited about the possibility that uh, the, the weinberg salam glashow theory might be right and uh, that they should continue looking at more aspects of it. Okay, there was a question there, and I'll come to you. I'll come to you. Uh, um, I wondered, uh, Professor Higgs, whether you still um, put your mind to theoretical problems. And I, 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 in related to that, I wonder what you might do, do next. Do you still think about theoretical physics, or will you do something like solve the Euro crisis? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, do I still think about theoretical physics? Uh, well, y yes, but from a distance. Uh, I, I mean, my, 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 uh, my activity uh, in theoretical physics of this sort really uh, came to an end around the mid-80s when I realized that the theoretical developments which I would have liked to contribute to at that time, which involved what's called supersymmetry, were essentially beyond my reach because I was too old. The people who were making progress were people with new, with new the new PhDs who were uh, about thir 30 years younger than me. And the ideas that I had for doing something in that, that field turned out to be wrong. Uh, somebody pointed out to me something, something that, that I'd failed to notice, and I realized I was just, just, just being, being stupid. Uh, I, I, well, I, I couldn't, at that age, uh, acquire sufficient new mathematical skills which were needed to, to contribute, so I stopped. Can I, add one, sorry, can I add one comment? Uh, uh, you heard that, that from Peter, but I think Victoria would agree with me that Peter has been the inspiration for all of a, a lot of undergraduates and postgraduates working within the Edinburgh, within Edinburgh University. And since we now have an alliance through super with uh, Glasgow, there is a, a big critical mass of undergraduates and postdocs and academics working in part of physics, both in theory and experiment, and that cooperation is bearing fruit here, and I think it will grow from strength to strength as a result of this. So there's a question okay, here. Thank you. My question is related to that, actually. Uh, Professor Higgins, would, uh, what recommendation or advice would you give to the young people, young students who are studying um, theoretical physics? And um, the second question is, we know that there is a portrait of you uh, in, um, in the School of Informatics um, at the university. Will that be moved to the new Higgins Center? Okay. So, um, advice to young theorists. <laughs> well, all I can really say, say, say is, again, keep at it. It's, it's a worthwhile thing to do. Uh, now, the portrait, uh, um, I, uh, you mentioned the informatics building. In, in, in fact, the, the portrait was intended for the, the James Clark Maxwell Building, which is where the Physics School of Physics and Astronomy is. And at the time the portrait was painted, uh, the, the, building, that, the building out at King's, the King's Buildings was being refurbished and couldn't take the portrait. So it was hung in informatics first of all, but it's now where it was intended to be yeah. in the James Clark Maxwell Building. So, so I, I can answer that, you bet. Um, <laughs> it shows how we were planning for a long time. Yes. <laughs> we have the portrait all ready to go. Uh, I'm, I'd like to wind this up really very quickly now. Are there any uh, last pressing questions where, you know, that are a matter of life or death? Uh, what will you do next? What? What will you do next? <laughs> Uh, I will, what I will do next, um, what I hope to do next will be 
no different from the things which I have been doing for a long time in my retirement. Uh, the only problem I, th I think will be that I shall ha have to dodge the press to continue. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or we which, which seems like a perfect <laughs> point at which I whisk Peter away. Uh, thank you once again, everybody, for attending this meeting. Uh, it is a very exciting uh, conclusion to uh, a 50-year period for us, uh, at the, or not me, of course, but uh, for the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and we're all very pleased and proud of Peter's work and the work of the physicists who've discovered uh, this new particle. So thank you, everybody. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.